Welcome students to uh, chapter seven of Principles of Marketing, uh, 18th edition. This is uh, Marketing uh, 3336 with Professor Ahern. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about chapter seven, uh, customer value driven marketing strategy, creating value for target customers. This is a, uh, a interesting chapter because it really talks about how value uh, is created and how the marketing function works to create value for the organization. So, uh, so let's focus in on this value creation uh, strategy as well as how products and services help to create value for the organization and how that works in the marketing function. So let's take an example of this, and this is discussed in our book as well. So uh, Procter & Gamble, for example, uh, they're actually the inventor pretty much of, of the concept of what we call brand management. And um, Procter & Gamble's brands actually not only compete with competitive company brands, but they actually compete with their own brands. If we see on the shelf space on the left, these are all the, the uh, brands and, and sub-brands of Tide ranging from regular Tide to, to Tide with, for gentle skin, uh, to Tide uh, heavy duty, for Tide looking at colors, bleach, all kinds of varieties of Tide, which, uh, which we target with different marketplaces. So Tide, what they're doing here is not only focusing on a general market of people who need detergents, but target markets of people who are looking for specialty products within that to be able to niche that market and also to maximize shelf space in the store so that when you go there, you'll see lots of options for Tide that in particular might fit what you're looking for. Let's take an example of one of those sub-branding areas, the uh, Tide uh, Free and Gentle. So when we think about Tide Free and Gentle and you see that, I'd like you to think about the connotations that come to mind regarding this. Like, what, what, who would the customer be that would use a Tide Free and Gentle? What would that be versus somebody who would use a, a regular heavy-duty Tide? Let's, let's look at a commercial really quickly for Tide Free and Gentle and see how that fits into what our thought process is about it and what that target market is likely looking at uh, specifically for people who want to buy Tide Free and Gentle. Choose the cutest outfits. Are you choosing a detergent designed for her sensitive skin? Tide Free and Gentle is. And unlike the leading free detergent, Tide Free and Gentle removes more residue from dirt, food, and stains. So you can be confident about every outfit you put her in. Even the ones she chooses. Tide Free and Gentle. Style is an option. So you see here that uh, what Tide does is Tide offers a unique value proposition for each market uh, segment, unique segment of the marketplace. Now, if we think about the, what is the segment of the marketplace that Tide Free and Gentle is going after, it's going after those who want a detergent that, that comes out non-abrasive, gentle, um, safe, possibly for children, for uh, delicates, things like that that are used in the wash cycle. So, so that we think about that, that's called the sub-branding. And products often will brand and sub-brand and think about the entire portfolio of products surrounding the offering within a marketplace. So, so let's, let's think about this. Let's think about this, uh, this what we con call the concept of targeted marketing. This is probably one of the biggest... Um, uh, innovations that marketing brings uh, to business in in the last hundred years or so, which is the idea of segmenting the market into smaller subgroups, using those subgroups to be able to create unique value propositions or to target each of those subgroups that we see valuable, and then to differentiate ourselves from the competition by positioning ourselves uniquely within each of those subgroups. So let's talk about each of these concepts, segmentation, targeting, differentiation, and positioning. Those are going to be things that we get into in some great detail this semester. It's going to be important that you understand each of these concepts. These are used throughout business all the time when we talk about phenomena uh, and we talk, we talk specifically about working with our products and services to be able to create unique value for customers. So let's, let's first get into segmentation. So when we talk about segmentation, segmentation is dividing the total market into smaller segments. 
So we take the total pie, and let's take that, for example, for the detergent market, for the cleaning market. And then we divide it up into smaller subgroups of people with unique needs in that marketplace. And there's a number of different ways we can think about dividing up that marketplace, but we saw the example of, uh, of the Tide and how they broke up their marketplace. But let's think about this concept of segmentation of ways in which we could be dividing marketplaces. So market segmentation requires dividing a market into smaller segments with distinct needs. So each of those groups, subgroups, has unique, distinct needs or characteristics. And they actually behave differently, so they require different marketing strategies or marketing mix strategies. Remember when we talk about marketing mix, this is where we refer to the four Ps. So the four Ps of marketing are our marketing mixes. So we have to think to ourselves, this subgroup of customers, what is it unique about them the way we would sell and, and market to that group to be as maximally effective as possible? That's what segmentation is all about. So let's, let's see a small video from Nielsen. Nielsen is one of the biggest market research companies in the world, and you probably have heard of Nielsen ratings. A lot of times when we look at viewership for... Um, for football games or TV shows or even movies and things like that, Nielsen rates those exposure models. But Nielsen is also quite famous for market research and segmenting marketplaces. And we're going to hear a little bit about their product that they use for market segmentation and market solutions. And, I, and, and let's pay close attention to this because I think this gives us an excellent example of the concept of segmentation. Nielsen Segmentation and Market Solutions. The consumer's world today is vast and interconnected. Every time a consumer glances at their TV, computer, mobile phone, tablet, even when they enter a store, they are generating data points. Over time, these data points tell a story about what makes them unique. Nielsen helps you build a complete picture of your consumers to drive better business decisions. At Nielsen, the core of what we do is to help you understand, find, and engage with your consumers. A complete view of your consumers provides you with the ability to drive more impact on your marketing activities and drive business decisions such as location planning, merchandising, and developing new products. And we do this by bringing all of our consumer, market, and local insights together in one intuitive web application called Nielsen Segmentation and Market Solutions. Let's take a moment to show you how. You must first understand your consumers. Who are the consumers you should focus on? What are their lifestyle and media preferences? Consumers are unique and their lifestyles drive their behaviors. For example, we have John. He is a millennial, 23 years old, and he uses his smartphone a lot. He finds mobile banking convenient and easy to use. And he likes to create and watch videos with his phone. He eats at Chipotle, shops at Abercrombie & Fitch, drinks at Starbucks every day, drives a Toyota Prius, and lives in an apartment in Seattle. John may not be your best consumer, but we can help you identify who is. Understanding your consumers doesn't just mean knowing what they are doing with you today, but looking ahead into the future to see what they want. Every consumer is unique, and you need to understand where their differences lie. Do they shop at high-end apparel retailers? If so, how much do they typically spend on each shopping trip? And which channels drive them to you? Are they likely to buy if you offer a promotion in email, in mobile, online, or print? Nielsen Segmentation and Market Solutions provides a deep, holistic view of your consumer, allowing you to fully understand the context of how to develop better products and create more engaging offers. Once you know who your best consumers are, the next step is to find them. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of um, Nielsen's strategy regarding segmentation and marketing solutions. So what they talked about is finding unique subgroups of individuals and those individuals that may are most likely to benefit from your product or your solution in that marketplace. So it's, it's interesting to see that. 
Um, and let's think about the different forms of segmentation that we often think about when we go to in marketing. A few of the more obvious ones are geographic segmentation. So that's when we segment uh, our marketplace on geographies. So uh, by segmenting on geographies, uh, what we're doing is we're looking, for example, at we take the United States, and if we were to take the United States, and let's just say this is a map of the United States right here, okay? And what we did is if we took it and we broke it into groups, and we broke it into four groups of the United States, we could then classify these each as geographical sectors of the United States and then look at the unique needs of each of those geographical sectors of the United States and how we could market our products to those different geographies. Um, you know, we could also look at things like urban versus rural geographies. All those kinds of geographical differences get into this geographic differentiation. The, the next that I'd like to talk about for a second is what we call uh, um, behavioral segmentation. So behavioral segmentation, is unlike geographic, it, it, in behavioral, we actually divide the groups up based on um, information about their knowledge, attitudes, and product uses. So, for example, in behavioral segmentation, we might look to, the, like, for example, how often they use products, uh, to what occasions they use them. Um, what's their, uh, are, they a, are they an expert on the products? Are they loyal users? Things like that. So it's all about the use of the product or service. And we, we look across groups of people based on how they use the products and then we bundle them into different usage segments. So that's our behavioral segmentation that's down here. The, the next is, uh, is uh, we could get into an example of, uh, and I want to show you a, a little example also in a minute, but we can think about demographic segmentation as well. So in demographic segmentation, this is where we break things up based on age groups, psych, uh, um, uh, like what they talked about in the video for Nielsen for millennials versus different age segments. We could also break it up into males and females. We could break it up into any type of demographic difference. Last class, we talked about the concept of psychographic as well, or the way people's beliefs or form opinions and, and, and thoughts. We're going to talk a little bit about that more as well. But let's give you an example of segmentation for pizza sauce. So let's say that we're a commercial pizza um, sauce market. So we have a, we're a commercial vendor of pizza sauce, meaning that we sell uh, to different companies that distribute pizza sauce. So we manufacture pizza sauce, and our goal is to sell to companies out there that buy pizza sauce. Our three main uh, customers that we have out there are food service firms. So these are companies like Cisco Foods or food distribution firms that are out there that, that distribute uh, products to restaurants. So they might go out there and buy, take our products and distribute to different restaurants. So many of you who've worked at a restaurant know that, uh, that these companies like Cisco or U.S. Foods go out there and actually sell their products and restaurants buy them and they use them in, the, in their, uh, in their uh, services to be able to create foods uh, So uh, when, they, when they do their recipes. So those are called food service firms. If we look who food service firm service, they service restaurants and cafes, pizza stores, independent and franchises. That's what those foods like those firms like Cisco do. So when we think about what are the unique needs of companies that that are food service firms. So let's think about what how do they buy? What are kind of pizza sauce are they looking for? Then we go down to another customer, manufacturers. These are people who actually manufacture pizzas, and they're, maybe they manufacture frozen pizzas or packaged ingredients. Think about like uh, some of our, uh, our grocery store pizzas that are out there and the manufacturers that actually uh, make these frozen pizzas. What are those unique needs of the pizza sauce that they're looking for for their pizzas? And then we look lastly at supermarkets. Supermarkets might buy directly instead of through frozen pizza manufacturers, and they might make their own pizzas in the supermarkets, uh, or what that's what's often called private labeling, where they, they might brand it Kroger brand pizzas, 
or they might actually not use a private label and uh, and just be able to brand it whatever that commercial sauce is. But you, you can see they might even create pizza sauces too and put pizza sauces on the shelf, Kroger pizza sauce. So if we think about each of these three groups, what is it about those groups that they may have unique needs and unique wants and even unique ways of buying? That's why we might segment the groups across these. And that's what we call a segmentation tree for pizza sauce. So we look at the direct customers and the downstream customers and what are those need differences across those groups. So when we think about market segmentation, we often think about five elements for, a, for something to be a good segment of the market, to be able to, to judge a good segmentation. The first is the me they're measurable. We can actually measure uh, the, the uh, elements of the information that we're looking to be able to capture for our segmentation. Accessible. The individuals that we're, we're targeting at, we can actually access them and get information from them and sell to them. Substantial. The, segmentation, the segment is large enough that we can actually act on. If the segment itself is too small, it's not valuable to us. Differentiable, meaning that uh, we can differentiate ourselves from, uh, uh, in that segment relative to other segments. It's, it allows us a unique positioning for people in that segment and actionable. We can actually use that information in our strategies to be able to implement our segmentation strategies out of the marketplace. All right, so that gets into segmentation. Let's next get into, we've segmented our market. Now we know what our segments are, and we want to be able to target our segments, figure out which segments that we'd like to go after. So the first step is to segment the market. The next is to target. So a target market is a set of buyers who share common needs or characteristics that the company decides to serve. So what are these markets that we think are valuable to us? Okay. So a few things that we look at when we're evaluating whether a market is valuable. The first is, is that segment, is it large and is it going to be growing? So for example, if that segment is very small and not substantial and it's not really a growing segment, it not, might not be valuable to us. The next one, does the segment have what we call structural attractiveness? So is the, is the composition of it attractive to the way we will work as a company? Next, does the company of uh, uh, our company objectives and resources align with the strategies for that segment? So, what we can do, we can actually serve that segment effectively. So, we we've segmented the market, we've chosen who we want to target, and then the last thing we do is we differentiate ourselves and our we position ourselves relative to the competition in the marketplace. I want to talk about this differentiation and positioning because these are important concepts. We're actually going to spend entire chapters on these topics later, but I'd like to introduce these concepts to you today. So product positioning is, is the way the product is defined by customers on important attributes. So positioning, let's think of Ikea. How Ikea, a life improvement store, when we think of Ikea, what comes to mind with Ikea? Well, it comes uh, convenience probably, uh, inexpensive, easy to be able to figure, to use. Uh, some of those basic elements about IKEA is that's what's called their positioning. And their positioning may or may not be in, of interest to different segments. So let's say we segmented our market uh, demographically and we said we segmented it in by, uh, let's say we segmented uh, the market by income. High income, medium income, low income people. Which of those groups would find IKEA uh, most valuable? Uh, we might ask ourselves. Now, we may, let's say we segment into younger, middle age, and old people. Which one of those might find IKEA valuable? So, so we can look at the way the positioning, the product is positioned, and the positioning uh, it, it allows us to be able to say, how, what are we thought of relative to the competition? That relative to the competition is what we call differentiation. So let's look at a positioning and differentiation map. So what this map is, is this is for uh, what we see here is SUVs, luxury SUVs in the marketplace, okay? So we have Cadillac, we have Infiniti, Lexus, Lincoln, Toyota, and Land Rover. 
think about what those vehicles look like and, and where they fall. We see here on this axis, this is whether it's a luxury vehicle or a performance vehicle. So if it's more performance, it goes this way. If it's more luxury, it goes this way. And this is price from 45,000 up to 95,000. So what it does is we put our dot at what level of performance that vehicle is perceived to be and what's the cost of that vehicle. And then the, one of the things I'd like to mention is the size of the circle is the size of, is the number of vehicles sold by that manufacturer. So the, the bigger the circle, the more the vehicles are sold by that manufacturer. So, so a small dot is a smaller subset of the market. A big dot is a bigger share of the market. So if we asked ourselves which vehicle is luxury and most expensive, that would be the Lexus right here, the Lexus LX570. That's a luxury vehicle uh, and it's very expensive. Now, if we looked at the performance expensive vehicles, there are two vehicles that fall in this group, the performance here and the more expensive vehicles. We have the Land Rover Range Rover, and we have the Toyota Land Cruiser. Both of those are here. What that means is, is these two probably compete directly against each other. When somebody's thinking about buying a Land Cruiser, they might actually think about buying a Range Rover. The question would be is which of these two wins in the positioning? Well, the one with the bigger circle is the one with the bigger share. So they tend to do a little bit better in the current marketplace, but they are positioned relative to each other. Well, which one's in the middle? Uh, uh, somewhere between luxury and performance and mid-priced? Well, that one here is the Cadillac Escalade, right here in the middle. And then we down here is the luxury but the lower cost vehicles. We have the Finity QX here, and we have the Toyota Navigator that's right here. The question would be is, is there a space open that we could position a new product in? And it looks to be, it's down in here. So that would be a performance vehicle that's lower in price, okay? So that's how we could look at this positioning map and see what we could do. So we could ask ourselves, if we were to put all the brands out there on Ikea, all the furniture brands, where would Ikea fall on this positioning map? We could do a similar thing that we did here, but that's a way to be able to look at positioning and differentiation in the marketplace. So when we're choosing a differentiation and positioning strategy, a few of the things we want to consider. We first want to identify a set of possible competitive advantages to build a position. So if we think about competitive advantages, if we look here, we see that Lexus has a competitive advantage. It is the only player in the marketplace uh, that is a luxury vehicle in the premium luxury market. So the question is, is, is that really an advantage for them? And, and, and do that, does that group find them valuable? Is that a big enough market? We have to choose the right competitive advantages. Which are the ones that we can leverage? We have the strategic capability to leverage on. We want to select our overall positioning strategy, and then we want to communicate and deliver that chosen strategy to the marketplace. So that gives you a pretty decent idea of the concept of segmentation, uh, positioning, differentiation, and targeting. So we should really understand those concepts and, uh, and get a good feel for those because we're going to be talking about those regularly this semester. Um, thanks, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you next session.